Hey, I'm Gopar, and this is a video on how I use Python in Emacs to create the workflow that I like. This builds on top of a video that I previously made called Lean IDE. It essentially is how I use Emacs without LSP or Eglot. I usually I basically just use bare bones tools in Emacs and just build on top of them to create an IDE like experience for myself. But this goes beyond that video and showing how I do it with Python with whatever Python tools I need. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. So here is my readme file that I have, or my configuration file that I have as a org mode file. Okay, so one of the first things that I'm gonna be talking about is that I do some things manually still. For example, on every fresh uh, BM virtual environment, I do pip install Jedi, EPC, import magic, rough, and mypy. Now I'm not gonna go over into what those tools are. Those are just packages that I install on every fresh install to make my development process a whole lot easier. I won't go over Python, basic Python stuff. If you're watching this video, I expect you know, you're used to working in Python, so you know the tools, the environment, and what a virtual M is and all that. Okay, so one of the things that I, well, I'll just explain my configuration as I go from top to bottom. So I use a uh, use package, and right here I'm configuring Python. I'm making sure that ensure, ensure is nil because the Python package is already built in. So there's a few bindings that I use. So control C, control P. I don't remember what this binds to, but I know I don't like it, so I put it to nil. And control Z, control Z is uh, runs Python, this little handy wrapper uh, function that I have. This function defined over here essentially is the same thing as starting your own shell. So run Python by itself starts a shell. But what I did is I wrote a little wrapper that checks if the project that I'm in is a Django project. And if it is a Django project, it's going to execute this command, which will which will provide a shell. But it's a shell with extra features. For example, all the models and everything related to Django already loaded into the shell, so I don't have to manually import it. It's pretty handy. Uh, the shell plus is not uh, in Django by default. You need to install another package. I believe it's, uh, it's called Django Model Utils or Django Plus. I don't remember, but a quick Google search on Shell Plus will provide you the package that you need. But yeah, this is just a simple wrapper around it to make sure that, hey, if it's a Django, this is what I really want. If it's just a normal generic Python project, just start a normal shell. That's pretty much it. Uh, next up is I have some hooks that start when I go into a Python file. For example, I set the forward as expression to nil. This is initially set to true at least when I was using Python. Uh, I mean, when I was starting to use Emacs, I don't know if it still is out of the box or not, but most likely it still is set to true. The forward S expressions make it so that when you move forward by S expressions, it will act the way that you expect it to do in Python. Originally, it moves in a certain way that I did not like or did not really did not really make sense with how I thought it would edit or it would move around. So setting this to nil makes it more normal in my case, more what I think would happen. So yeah, that's just something. Another one is that I make the shell and virtual environment uh, this variable, um, a local variable for each buffer, because I might be working on multiple projects and each multiple project will have its own dedicated virtual environment. So I'm just saying, hey, just you know, for every file, just make, a, make this variable buffer local and yeah, let's not worry about it. Now, what I have is completion functions if you watch my Lean IDE video, you will know that I don't use any type of smart completion. Uh, most of my completions are just what I call dumb completions. So for example, Kate file is just makes auto completion if it looks like a file and that one doesn't really require because it Emacs just looks at the file system and tries to show me if there's anything at point and tries to auto complete it. Python completion at point. I don't think this one actually does anything. I think I can take it out, but I don't remember. Diabrev or Dabrev, however you say it, is just uh, completes auto completion on things that I've previously typed before and Cape keyword it looks up keywords in that specific language and tries to complete it for example not or or would be auto completed because those are keywords in Python just things like that now whenever I go into inferior Python mode aka shell mode I'm just gonna say hey completion at point functions just set to true I forget what this does but I remember vividly that if this was set to nil I would have some very bizarre errors and setting it just to true would make the errors go away. I can't recall that correctly. If you know what I'm talking about, please comment below and you know educate all of us because I forgot what the context was around this. But all I know is that I need to set this to true. Okay, what else? I have some custom configurations. For example, this uh, variable, 
I know that it's relatively new in Emacs. I think only from 27 or 28 up this exists. But essentially what it says, whenever I create a new shell, that shell is going to be tied to that project. So for example, if I'm in a project file uh, called A, and then I go to another project file called B, but if it's in the same project and I, and I run, run, and I call the command to pop up a shell, it will reuse that same shell throughout that whole project. But if I go to a different project and then I run shell, it will create a shell just for that project. So it can, it keeps everything to itself. Originally, what it will do is it will create a shell per file, which could be annoying because in case you want to reuse a single file, a uh, single shell for the entire project, which is I think the most common use, uh, it would be annoying because you would just have a bunch of shells and you would need to find which one which one is the one that you want. So setting this to project just simplifies that whole thing. And I'm here. I'm setting the interpreter. I'm just saying you know bare bones Python, nothing fancy, no no arguments for that. And again, I'm doing this one. Oh, actually, I can. I guess I can just remove this. I'm not going to mess around with it. And then I say, hey, completion native disabled in these interpreters. So I believe this is a remnant of when I used to use Alpi. There was a bug that you needed to exclude. Otherwise, there would be some weird configurations with whatever completion manager you were using. Uh, but I don't believe that's the case anymore. I can't remember. But this, I'm pretty sure this was because I was using Alpi or some other third party uh, library that I needed to configure this. So yes, those are bare bones uh, configurations. What I'm going to be talking about next is more of, well, not just uh, Python package itself, but other packages that I use. Next up is virtual environment and PyBEM. Now, virtual environment and PyBEM, they both do the same thing. They both do, they do, both handle virtual environments. So you're saying, okay, they both handle virtual environments, so why are you using them? Well. Virtual environment I use because it's what I already had for the longest and the issue that I had with that one was be it was there wasn't an, an easy way to create virtual environments like meta x create something I have to do a little bit of setup and pym conveniently provided a function called pym create which will automatically create the environment and I didn't have to do anything it would just do meta x pym I tell it with the name of it what python version I want and it would create everything which was beautiful so what I ended up doing was I use uh, virtual M this package for pretty much everything that is not creating environment. So if I need to create environment, I simply just use pym just for that one command. And then everything else, I use virtual M because virtual M is a good package. I just didn't like the way it created stuff. So I downloaded py pip -M, um, no, I'm sorry, pip -M, py -M, and I just use it right here. Like I said, just solely for this. And then whenever I need to work on a on a virtual environment, I do BEMP work. I add this in the dir locals, which I can show in a bit. So how does this, uh, the configuration? Oh, it's pretty simple. I just say, hey, I just want to install it. Since I don't really use it for anything, I don't really need to configure it. I just say, hey, just make sure it's installed. And then I'll take care of it. And this one, I say, hey, this uh, just initialize it in eShell2 so that eShell can support it automatically. So I don't have to do work on virtual environment name. It just does it automatically, picks it up. Next up, I have some packages that are linters for, slash formatters. And two of the most popular in the Python world right now are black and iSort. As you can see, they're commenting it out because I replaced both of these with rough, which it basically does the same thing, but it is reduced to one tool, which if there's less dependencies in my project, I'm all for it. So that's the main reason I installed rough. But I'll go over black configuration and iSort just to you know, show for those who still use it. So my configuration is pretty straightforward. I say, hey, install black end if it's not. And then I have a hook. So it's like, hey, run this whenever I go into a Python mode. And this little function just is a wrapper. It just says, hey, if we have the black program, then enable it. If not, then, you know, just print out a message. Hey, we don't have it. And life goes on. The reason I added this wrapper was because there were some projects that black was not installed for whatever reason. And I would always get errors uh, popping up when I would switch to those projects. So adding a little wrapper around it just made it convenient for me. But like I said, I moved on to rough, so that's not really an issue anymore. Of course, I still need to have rough installed, otherwise the same problem, but for most of the projects, I just install rough, even if the even if the code that I'm working on doesn't have it. I could have done the same thing for iSort, but it is what it is uh, for black and iSort, but yeah. Now for iSort, it is the exact same thing as black, I, almost identical, even the same wrapper function. Uh, for it, except I just check if I sort is enabled. Otherwise, I say, "Hey, not enabled," and we're not gonna, we're not gonna use it. Pretty much. Now for rough, 
rough is essentially a simple little linter formatter packaged into one plus some other goodies and I say hey whenever I go into a Python mode just add rough format on save and it will reformat the buffer I can also add a convenient little wrapper like, like the for black and ice sort but honestly I just pip install it on rough even if it's not in the project requirements because that just makes life easier for me as a developer next up I use import magic if you haven't heard of import magic it essentially has to do with imports <laughs> and if I use a library uh, for example in my code for example um, the request library is a very popular one request module allows you to easily make a networking request for APIs or anything like that but if I don't import request at the top and I just do request.get I'll get an error hey request module is not found so if I call import magic import magic will look at the imported errors that says hey this isn't found and will automatically import them which makes it easier because I don't have to go to the top and import them I just do meta x import magic and it'll look for any references that are not defined and it'll try to import them and then add them if they exist next up is pydoc so pydoc is documentation on point it's just one of the things that I use I use pydoc and I use something called devdocs I use devdocs 90% of the time and I use pydocs like the other 10% it's usually I usually use pydoc for built-in python stuff but at this point, uh, the libraries that I use with the Python built-ins, I pr know pretty well, so I don't have to look up documentation that often. It's only when I'm using a new Python module library, built-in mo library, that I'm like, hmm, I don't quite remember the arguments, or I don't know this, then, then I call that. But of course, devdoc also provides that, so most of the time I'm, ref I'm looking at devdocs. But anyways, I'm going to talk about uh, PyDoc. So I have it bound to Control c Control d and I have PyDoc at point. So what is PyDoc at point? So what does GoPyre PyDoc at point do? Well, this little function just calls the documentation on point. And if I do, if I pass in a prefix, then it just says, hey, uh, close the close the argument, which I actually don't think this is work because it doesn't have the argument prefix. So I don't, the control U might be a lie. Like I said, I don't really use this that often, so this might be a lie, I need to fix this. But anyways, I'll go move on. So I'm setting the default directory to whatever directory the file in it is in. The reason I'm doing this is because if I didn't do this, that the, the PyDoc buffer would not be associated with the project. So if I would do projectile buffers, it would not show up. So I wanted it to show up whenever I was to look for project buffers. That's the reason why I'm doing this. Uh, the next is oh yeah right here current prefer arc nil huh, so I guess I am doing it okay so it says hey if uh, if I do con call call it with a prefix just close it otherwise just look at the symbol at point and create the documentation window now one of the things that I have set up is that I want this to always show up on the right side which is what I do here in the configuration I use the buffer display buffer a list if you don't know what this is you can basically configure this variable to display certain buffers however you want within Emacs so if you always want it at the top bottom left or right you can look at this buffer and learn how to how to configure it so that it works correctly Mickey Peterson uh, I believe is the author of mastering Emacs he has a great article on this pretty in-depth and that's how I learned about this and that's how I have it configured as well next is Jedi now someone in my lean IDE video asked me why I didn't use Jedi and the reason for that is because I, when I used Jedi like a few years ago, it wasn't that great. Um, I don't remember if it was if it, the package itself just wasn't mature enough, or if it was because of the Jedi to, uh, Emacs tooling that was available at the time that wasn't great. So after that comment, I decided to actually give Jedi another try and see see how much it has proved. And you know, so far it looks pretty good. The only reason why I decided to install it again was because I missed the documentation that popped up not popped up but documentation that was that was given to me via ldoc so right now before i install this my original workflow was that I didn't have any pop any type of documentation i would always have to call devdocs and reference it via there to look up what arguments i can pass but with devdoc with jedi installed all i have to do is just be the, in enable it and set hey this tooltip method to nil nil makes it so that it doesn't use a pop-up buffer or anything like a pop-up window it just makes it so that it uses ldoc in the mini buffer to display the documentation so 
that's what I ended up using. I only use it for just this one method in the LDOC uh, to show it in LDOC in the mini buffer. That's pretty much it. I do not use any other any other functions in the Jedi. And I say right here, hey, I just need Jedi and EPC to make this work. Okay, now I talked about DevDocs and my Lean IE, like I mentioned, but now I'm gonna look at it a little bit more closely. It's specifically for the Python stuff. So I have Control C, Control, I'm sorry, Control C, Meta D to look up DevDocs. So I just have a thin wrapper that says, hey, what, look up whatever thing at point I'm at so that I don't have to retype the thing that I'm looking at. Because most likely if I call it, I'm trying to call it on whatever I'm on. So it's just a thin wrapper around that. I can show you, uh, oh, it's right here, yeah. So as you can see, I just grab the thing at point and then I pass that in DevDocs lookup. So it's just a very simple wrapper. But the thing that I wanna show is for Python mode. So for Python mode, I set the current docs uh, you can set this so for whatever mode you're doing, it will all limit the scope of documentation to search for in those libraries. So for example, I limit it to Django, Django REST framework, and Python 3.11 when I am in Python mode. When I am in a web mode, which is pretty much anything that has to do with the front end for me, since web mode handles pretty much everything, which is amazing, I say, hey, when I'm in web mode, I most likely want to look for Vue, Vue Router, JavaScript, all these things, HTML, CSS. I want the documentation to be narrowed to just those things. So that's how I use DevDocs for Python, uh, for Python projects, specifically Django. Now, when I start working in a Python project or I start jumping around projects, I have directory local variables that I set up so that Emacs knows what Python environments to set up for which project and some other goodies that I just want related to those projects. So for example, in this project, I set projectile project test to just PyTest. So whenever I run the, the projectile test command, it will automatically set to PyTest. Of course, I can change it, add to it, whatever. But for now, I just have PyTest so that I don't have to type it. And then the more important one is I say, hey, virtual M to work on is named Awesome Possum or whatever you want to call it. So whatever virtual environment you want to be working on when you work on this project, this is how you will do it. You would just add a directory. You would edit the durlocals.l in your project root and set this to whatever virtual environment name you need to work on. And that just hooks up everything else so that everything else works flawlessly. And even with that, eShell will also work. So here I have an eShell buffer and if I do which Python, it just says, hey, this is the virtual environment path. And of course I have it so that it shows me which current environment I'm in. So I don't have to do which Python and things like that. It just, I just automatically know which one I'm working on on the spot whenever I have to do that. So also, also I have it set up with B term. Now B term, the reason why this one works is not because of eShell, it's because I have edited my dots dash RC file for my bash shell. And the reason why it does this is because I have a package called power level 10k. So it's a theme for your terminal. And since B term inherits is essentially is uh, your own terminal inside of Emacs it just inherits from that and it will use the configuration. So this is pretty nice and handy and this theme automatically takes into account the Python environment, so that's why it works. But that is it, yeah. Okay, that was a quick overview on my Python workflow. That's just what works for me. Some of you might be saying, hey, that's crazy. Just use LSP or Eglon, you know, you're just making life harder for you. That's fine. I've given my reasons as to why I don't use those tools, even though they are great. And I think most people should use them if you can get them to work correctly. I might give them a try in a few years, but for right now, this works for me. With that said, let me know if there's any packages or any other things that you do in Python for Python workflows that maybe I should try or if you learn something new. But yeah, let me know. Remember, knowledge grows when it is a share. So take care, guys. Bye.